This morning we talked about the king and his kingdom. The king from heaven is setting up a kingdom upon the earth. And in looking at the book of Matthew, I doesn't have much to say about the church. Several references are in the book of Matthew, but it's kind of like reading through the Old Testament and all of a sudden there's a verse that's a verse on prophecy and you don't even know that it's there. Until Jesus came, some of those verses probably were not even understood. And all of a sudden you can say, hey, that's Christ, that's Christ, that's Christ, that's Christ. And it's all over the Old Testament. But some of those prophecies, it seems like you're just reading along and there's a verse that's put it in just, now what's that got to do with this? And then you look above it and below it a little bit, you know, and it's very interesting as you study the Bible. Well, when we come to the book of Matthew, a lot of people are getting some things like the rapture of the church mixed up with the second coming of Christ to the earth. So they're putting all of this as the rapture also. So that you and I are going to go through the tribulation period and then Christ comes back. So instead of us looking for the blessed hope, we're looking for the blessed tribulation. I don't think so. So by understanding dispensations, then we know that this seven years belongs back here with the 69 weeks that have already gone forth, which was 483 years. So when we come and understand that when the Lord starts talking about the kingdom of heaven, you notice that whenever in the sixth chapter of Matthew, it says that whenever they were wanting to know about prayer, he says, um, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So even that, what they consider to be the Lord's Prayer, which I believe John 17 is, but that is talking about this kingdom upon the earth. And so when you begin to look at it, you find out that there's some things that God has said that will happen at the end of this tribulation period. And we know where that goes, and then when you go back into the book of Matthew, and you see certain things that are said, you know, hey, that belongs here. It can't be referring to the rapture of the church. And so there's people who are getting all these things all mixed up, and they teach it, and a lot of people believe it. You'd be surprised how many times just from the people who have left Calvary Community Church that have emailed me and sent me CDs, DVDs, links, trying to straighten me out on when the rapture is going to happen or, you know, it's going to be in the middle or it's going to be over here. And they think, they, they think, I've never studied this before. And they're just blessed to their little peeping in heart that they're able to straighten the preacher out. And I'm talking about people that have just left this ministry in a few years. Because when you're here, you hear it and you say, that's what I believe. You can go and sit under somebody else and you'd be surprised how fast you can change. I mean, it don't take long. And then you think you're hearing something new. Well, evidently, Yankee and Hank didn't understand this. Well, I think probably me and Hank did get it. And we haven't heard anything new. It's the same old thing. And I believe it's because they don't rightly divide the word of God. So anyway, I do believe that understanding Matthew helps you understand the church even better in the rapture of the church. Now this morning we ended off with the 13th chapter of the book, but I want you to look first of all in chapter seven of Matthew. Now, many times I've taken these principles, truths that are found here in the seventh chapter and have developed many messages on them, on the clarity of the gospel, the two natures, and about the, um, the two ways, the two kinds of fruit, because of the two kinds of trees, and all that's mentioned right here, and it's in chapter seven and verse 13 <clears throat> to verse 23. <clears throat> Now, even though these scriptures are here, 
Is it talking about the church age or is it, could it be talking about the kingdom of heaven? Now look what he says here in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the, the what? Kingdom. kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the king and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. So how do you get into the kingdom of heaven? Well, believe it or not, you have to get into the kingdom of God in order to, back then, to get into the kingdom of heaven. This is the physical kingdom upon the earth, where he's literally here, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of them, they're all here in a body upon the earth. That would be a wonderful thing, to be here and see all of that. And I believe I will be here. But to get into the kingdom of God, you have to believe on Jesus Christ, trust him as Savior. This is what, as you read through the book of Matthew, the leaders would not believe on him. They would not trust him. And so, because they would not believe, he says, you're not going in. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he's really, he's addressing those people that he was talking to at that time. But the same truth is truth about going to heaven. You still have to be born again. So John chapter 3 when he talked about you must be born again or you can't see the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God. The answer to all of that was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So you had to believe on Jesus Christ. And so when you come here to the book of Matthew in chapter 7 and he makes this statement there in verse 23, and then will I profess unto you I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They wouldn't believe that he was who he claimed to be. See, this is really about the king and the kingdom. And what did you have to do to get into the kingdom? You had to believe on the Messiah. But now notice what it says in chapter 5. Just look there real quickly in chapter 5. And notice in verse 20. In verse 20, he makes this statement. He says, For I send you except except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the what? Kingdom of heaven. So you can't get in unless your righteousness is better than their righteousness. Well, their righteousness was of the law. There's only one other kind of righteousness there can be, and that's grace. So they had to believe on the Lord. And so even John 3.16 was not the end of Christ's ministry. John 3.16 was at the beginning of Christ's ministry. So Jesus didn't have, you know, uh, a works message to get saved and get into the kingdom. And then you had to just believe on Christ. I oh, know it was the same message. He always used the law to convince people they can't save themselves by the law so that they would trust Christ as their Savior. So you see that here in chapter 5. It's mentioned in quite a few other places, but um, you'll notice here in chapter 6 of Matthew, look at Matthew chapter 6, when he makes a statement in verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. See, that's not the prayer of the church. See, we're, we're not talking about, you know, now we're going to be here, but see, we're way back here. We're way back here. We know to be absent from the body, present with the Lord, and we're going to heaven. We're looking for Jesus Christ to come in the air and take us out of here. Because we know that there's a seven-year tribulation period, and God has not appointed us under wrath. This is not for us. This is the persecution of God's wrath upon Israel as a nation for what they did, believe it or not, way back there. And... God's going to chasten all the nations that comes against Jerusalem right here. And believers will get to go into the, the millennium, into the kingdom with the Lord. So, you understand that from chapter 7. Now, go over there to chapter 13. Chapter 13. Now, the kingdom uh, becomes like a mystery, but notice... As you go through with all of these mysteries, it's talking about a particular period of time. See there in verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables. So these are some parables that he spoke. And then he makes a statement there in verse 11, He answered and said unto them, 
because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. So they were now going to be having something about this kingdom of heaven explained to them in parables because when Jesus spoke, it's like a mixed multitude. Those who wanted to know truth can understand it. Those who don't want to know truth couldn't understand it because they wouldn't believe. So there's a certain amount of enlightenment. Truth leads to truth. And when you accept truth, you can understand more truth. So it's like light leads to light. Light leads to the source of light. So this is why this is so important. So he goes through here and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. Now, he also lets them know that he knows that they are dull of hearing and their eyes are closed. And he quotes all the way back from the book of Isaiah describing these people in the way that they are. So then he makes this statement here in verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. See, this is not about the church. The church hasn't started yet. This is still about Jesus and the kingdom. He's coming. He's the king. And he's telling them things about the kingdom. But there is beginning to be a slow progression away from the kingdom teaching and the kingdom being offered to Israel because he says, you put it from you. You don't want it. <laughs> You're not going to get it. And so another program is going to be started. But now, you notice what he says here also. Look there in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. The kingdom of heaven. And look also over there in verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven. Now see, when we get through and you look at all of these things and you know where these scriptures belong, what it's talking about, not talking about the church, then you can go back and you can look at those parables and then understand a little bit about what it's not, you'll have a better idea what it is. But when you don't know what it isn't, then you, don't, you get confused. And so there's many people who are saying this is all about the church. Well, the church is back here. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. So I believe there's a, that's the key to understanding some of this. I'm not saying it's the easiest portion of scripture to, to grasp because a lot of books have a lot of difficulty in them. And sometimes it's kind of like, a, you know, you're eating a good meal and you get a gristle and, man, you can't hardly chew it. Can't even cut it. Now, you can sit there and choke on it or you can spit it out and go ahead and try to understand what you can. And then later on, you can come back there and try to rightly divide it and well, it's not so bad. Cut in smaller pieces. Now, some pieces I'm still working on. I've still, got, I've still got a few gristles here and there. But you notice in verse 33, another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. And so as you go through there, he keeps talking about this kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 41, I want you to see this. The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity out of this kingdom. So there's things that God's not going to tolerate in his kingdom. We know he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And then look what he says in verse 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, where you have this little statement right here, uh, hold your place right here and just look there in the book of Matthew chapter 3. One more time. Where we were looking at earlier this morning, when John the Baptist came on the scene and he was announcing the king is coming. He made this statement about, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The baptism of fire is not something that you want. That's hell. That is hell. And so he says here in the last part of verse 14, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now notice, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In the other place, it just has 
and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But could it be the same time? This is about the king and what's going to happen and how he's going to judge things at the end of the age. The end of this age would be the end right here. Because this starts a new period of time. When this ends right here, there's going to be a judgment, a separation from the wheat and the tares. When the rapture takes place, it's just all believers are gone. But whenever we're taken up, there's, there's not this, you know, they're not going to hell here. That, that, that's over here. But you try to put that over here, see, now it won't fit because it, it's, it's not there. It's just that we're taken out of here and caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So as you look at it, a lot of it will make a lot more sense. Look in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure. In verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. In the verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven. Now, I wonder why I keep saying that. You, you don't find this in other books. You find this in the book of Matthew. This deals with the king coming from heaven, going to set up his kingdom. And so it's a literal period of time. And God said, it's like this. It's like this. It's like this. Because what they needed to understand is he is right now not going to set up his kingdom. They have refused him. They don't want him. So he says, you're not going to have it. No forgiveness for you in this time, in this life. Because you have to believe on Christ. These are the leaders. So in chapter 14, notice what he says. Then you have here where the, the king feeds the flock. He feeds the multitude. You go back to Jeremiah and Isaiah and some other places. It talks about how that, um, the, the flocks are destroyed because the pastors. The pastors were not feeding the flock. And they weren't teaching the people the word of God. And he says the, the, the priests are, are wrong, the prophets are wrong, and the people are messed up. Everybody's messed up. All of them. Jesus is a good shepherd. And he saw the multitudes. And you find here the feeding of the 5,000 and so forth. And Jesus, instead of trying to feed those religious leaders, they didn't want the truth. But the common people. They followed him everywhere. And Jesus would teach them. But you see, the... The balance of power is in the hands of the leaders. They were the rulers of the, the nation. And it was in their hands. And he says, by wicked hands you have taken the innocent one and slain. So you'll notice here in chapter 14. He says there in verse, uh, nine, uh, 14, excuse me, verse uh, 14. Jesus went forth and saw the great multitude and was moved with compassion uh, toward them. And he healed their sick. So he began to do some things for the individuals, and he has them all set down. He feeds them and all these things that he did for them. Uh, but when you get to chapter 15, see, chapter 14, he feeds the flock. Now he's fleecing the shepherds. He's taking these leaders, and he's taking them to task and letting them not get away with anything. He really begins to rebuke them. And so he takes them to task because now they coming out and they not only just challenging him, they're trying to, in front of the multitude, put him down. Who gave you the right? Where did you get this authority? Who do you think you are? And so as you go through the 15th chapter, you'll see that he calls them. He does a pretty good job over in the 23rd chapter too. But he, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. Now one thing I want you to see, he says there in verse uh, 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And I think Jesus purposely offended them. He, this, like me, he, he done had enough. He's... He's been sweet and he's been kind. Now he's going to get very blunt with them. But you'll notice when he makes this statement in verse 13, 
And he answered and says, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall he root up. Now, you see, where does that come from? I mean, all of a sudden, it just seems like there's a, a statement in there like that. Well, it's there for a reason. So hold your place right here and just look in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew. The seventh chapter of Matthew. Now remember, he said he was going to put the axe to the root of the tree in chapter 3 and cut down every tree that would not bring forth fruit. Well, every person born into this world has a sinful nature. We are trees. We're supposed to have righteous fruit on our trees. And if you don't have righteous fruit on the tree, that's a bad tree. That tree has to come down. Since every man sins, every man has to die. Every man has to die. So he says here in verse 17, Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth fruit is hewed down, cast into the fire. This is what's going to happen to every person that has never trusted Christ as Savior. You see, that's the, the bad tree. Jesus said, the Lord will cut down every tree that he hasn't planted. Now, when I trusted Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit planted that seed inside of me, and I believed that I, in my new birth, am a plant of God. So I'm good to go. Now, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, you're good to go. And so that's why all of a sudden you see a little verse like that, because it's talking about you don't believe on Christ. He still gave them the same gospel message that he gives to us that you find in the rest of the gospels. But they were to believe on the Lord. And unless your righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is for believers. The beginning seed of this kingdom was all believers. At least that's what I believe. Now, there are saved people who go in, and then it's their children that must trust the Lord. And so there's going to be some that will be born in the kingdom. You know, some maybe it's the tares. And then there's going to be another judgment at the, even at the end. Because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to die even during the millennium. Some believe that they'll have a, maybe a lifespan of 100 years. If they haven't trusted the Lord by the time of 100 years, they'll, time to go, Charlie. And that's it. Now, in chapter 15, you find also there is a, a Gentile woman, Syrophoenician woman, who comes to him. And you see down there in verse 21 and 22, coming from the coast, a woman of Canaan. She cried out and says, Have mercy on me, in verse 22. O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, Not a word. Disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and he says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, does that sound like the church? What does he tell the church? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, how can you apply that to this? Okay, it won't fit. But he's still in human flesh. He's still in Israel, and he is still concerned about his, the people. So he says, I can't go anywhere else. This is where I'm sent. And all that he could do was what his father's will was. Whatever is the will of my father, I will do. And so he says here, Then she worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered and says, It is not meat or fit to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. In other words, it's not fit for me to take the food for the children of Israel and give it to you Gentiles. Now, Jesus would never say anything like that. But he did. Because it's the truth. He, at this point, it's Israel's. He hasn't sent the message out yet to do anything other than this. He has to fulfill the will of the Father. Now, she says, yes, but even the dogs likes to eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. 
In other words, if the, if, if the Jews don't want it, why can't we Gentiles have it? I think there's a message there, and I'm not preaching on that tonight, but I think there's more to it. So that's mentioned in verse 27. So you go through here, now you look over in chapter 16, the king rejects. He's rejected, but he now it becomes the head of the church, and he's talking a little bit about the church. Now he's starting to filter into something else because it's phasing into some other teaching because Jesus knows they have rejected him. He hasn't yet entered into the city upon the donkey and where the people go wild over him, but the Jews were, leaders were trying to figure out how to kill him. Some people wanted him and the leaders wanted to kill him. And they wanted him dead. So you see this. In verse 18, it says about the church. But before you get down to that, you'll notice in verse 13 where Jesus asked him, and this is the northern part of Israel, Caesarea Philippi. I've been there a number of times. Six times I've been there. But at this place, he says, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? To me, that's like asking, when was the War of 1812? But anyway, the Son of Man see, is the kingdom title. And so here you have, or oh, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or Isaiah, one of the prophets. He says, but whom do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter spoke him and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Now Peter was a pebble, and Christ was a rock. And upon, he says, thou art Peter, but upon this rock, this rock does not refer to Peter. Amen. This rock is referring to Christ himself. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that truth, he will build his church. Now, he hasn't founded it yet, hasn't started it yet. But the payment was made by Christ when he died on the cross. So you have here in verse 18, this is what was going on. Now, as you go down through here, you see a lot of these things and you wonder, what's going what's gonna to happen next? Here's the king. How would you think? How would you feel? So in chapter 17, he gives certain ones a glimpse of the kingdom, a glimpse of himself in glory. Let me ask you something. The Bible talks about him coming and power and great glory, seven times brighter than the sun. You know, that's pretty bright. And then he also makes a statement in chapter 24. He said that when he comes, the light will shine as far as the east is to the west. I mean, brilliant. And about the clothes that he had on, the linen and how bright it was. What if you were back there and you got to see Jesus in his glory? That ought to make you as bold as anything else in the whole world. You would never fear anything. Did you know that Peter was there and he saw all of that? He saw that. Did you know that later on he even wrote about that? But somewhere in between he forgot about something. When they saw him taken and crucified. And I don't know. I don't know the guy. No, I've never met him before. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. The Bible says he cursed Peter. Now, you know God can never use somebody that goes around cursing. That's, that's ungodly. But could God use him? Did God use him? Did God say, well, I'm sorry, you done blew it now, bud. I can never use you. You know, if God can't use people who mess up, he wouldn't have anybody to use. If you think he ha you have to be so perfect for God to use you, then you might as well watch, forget it. Forget it. Don't go any further. But God uses sinners, save sinners. And uh, it'd be nice if we could all just walk and live like that. But here is a glimpse, and he was transfigured before him. But see, he didn't show him this. He showed him this. Because, see, this is still Jewish. I still have an idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're like part of the Old Testament. But then that's another story. Here in the book of Matthew, 
he goes through here and, and explains some of these things and who he is and what he's supposed to do and the power that he has. And um, he says um, up there in verse 20, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your, and see that word? Your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. But then he's talking about also they're, they're going to lose out on so much because, oh, he was talking about somebody to believe. But there's so many who have unbelief. They will not believe on the Lord. So those that won't believe him, he says, then you, because you rejected the kingdom here, you're not getting into the kingdom. They didn't get to go. They won't go. Why? They never trusted the Lord. Now, anyone who trusted the Lord, sooner or later, we're going to be all together in this kingdom upon the earth. I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. Now, look in chapter 18. There's parts of the kingdom message here. And it looks like it kind of feeds over into the message of the church. It hasn't come yet, but it's going to. See, there becomes a little bit more, a little bit more. Not a lot, but just a little. So when you look there in Matthew in chapter 18, you look there in verse 17 where he says, And if he shall neglect to hear him, tell it unto the church. So he gives them a little bit of a teaching about the church. Because what he's teaching here to his disciples is something that's also good for the church. Though it's not happened yet. He hasn't even started it yet because the church didn't start until the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> but you'll notice in the book of Matthew chapter 18, he says in verse 1, And the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, and who is the greatest in the, see those words? Kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. And he says down here in verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, in verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of heaven stuff. All the way up until the 18th chapter, still talking about the kingdom of heaven. But if you take all these scriptures and try to apply it to the church, you're going to find a lot of things that this just ain't going to fit. Because he's talking about Matthew, in the book of Matthew, about the king and the kingdom. Now, you go on down through here and he talks about as a little child. In verse 14, it talks about it is not the will of your father that any one of these little ones should perish. And then after this, you see where God takes and gives to the church the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because... Israel may not do that job, and they have to be set aside. But they have not been cast away, in other words, like they're no longer belong to the Lord, and God's plans are never going to be fulfilled. No, it was postponed. What God promised to happen, it's going to happen, and the king is going to come, and he's going to rule. And so we don't take all the promises that God made back there in the Old Testament and put them onto the church. Now, there's like one good promise that you read back there. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and, and so forth, forsake their evil ways and call upon me, I will hear their prayer and I will heal their land. Now, that's good, but that's really to Israel. It's, it's to Israel. Now, we can take that verse and apply it to America if we want to, but the initial you know, premise is that that's, that's the promise that God made to Israel, and I believe God will keep his word to Israel. But there's no promise that God has to do that for America. We can pray that he will. We can pray that because there's a lot of righteous, godly people in America, that God could still save our country for our sake. But I wouldn't give up praying just saying, well, you know, there's so many wicked people in this world. They sure are. But there's always been wicked people. But we can still pray and ask God. And doesn't the Bible say in Timothy that, uh, you know, pray for the leaders and so forth? It, it, is it the will of God that everybody be saved? I believe it's there. And I believe we ought to pray and trust the Lord for that. But I, taking verses out of context sometimes is not always the best. But if you say, look, I just want to apply this to this. I can apply it to a lot of things. But the primary purpose of this portion of Scripture, this is what he's talking about. And I believe in many cases this is what he's talking about here. So look in chapter 19. Chapter 19. You have here, it's talking about salvation, but it's uh, the king's key to the kingdom. And it's uh, a little bit about, you know, salvation and what you have to understand. So you look there in verse 16 where he says, One came unto me and said, 
Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And um, I believe it's important to understand what he says about have a have how to have eternal life is the message that we still preach today. We always use the law to show that a person cannot save themselves and that it's impossible and that they must trust Christ. So he uses the law to explain to this young person that he cannot keep the law to be saved. He asked him a number of things like there in verse 18. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. And thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Well, that looked like he covered everything. And the young man says, I've kept all those from my youth up. What lack I yet? Well, Jesus didn't tell him about coveting. He says, well, if that's the truth, go take everything that you have because he was a rich young ruler. I mean, this is your Don Juan. I mean, he's rich and he's young. And he's a ruler. He's somebody. So therefore, he says, sell everything that you got and then come and follow me. And he had a lot of riches. Well, he wasn't willing to do that. See, he wasn't keeping all of the law. God used thou shalt not covet to prove to the man you're not really keeping the law. And so by the time they got through, the disciples asked him and says down there in verse 25, when his disciples heard they were exceedingly amazed, and who then can be saved? Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is what? It's impossible for a man to save himself. But with God all things are possible. So the apostles wanted to know, hey, we didn't follow you. We didn't gave up everything. What are we going to get out of this? So he says here in verse 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, That ye which have followed me in the regeneration, Look up here. That this period of time. When the time of the refreshing shall come, found in the book of Acts, referring to this period of time. When this period of time comes, he says, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Or does that say the anything about the church? Look what he says, the twelve tribes of what? We're talking about Israel. So here, when Christ comes back and sits upon the throne of his glory, they're going to be able to rule and reign with Christ in high positions. Remember the mama that came to him and says, well, well, anyway, when you get into the kingdom, you know, I want my one boy to sit on this side, and I want my other boy to sit on this side. Isn't it sweet to have a mama like that? Well, this is, the, this is that period of time that they're talking about right here. So when you see he's talking about still chapter 19, we're still talking about the kingdom. We're not talking about setting up the church yet. He's, probably, he's going to, but that hasn't been done yet. So you don't take these verses out of context and throw those up there. And many, as he says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Remember, there is just the verse. It's just one item that can be looked at. Is that um, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel came to the Jew. But there's a possibility. I'm not sure yet. When Christ comes back, all these Gentiles, he has them get to go into the kingdom before the Jew. I'm not sure. First and last, there's something there that's more than meets the eye. Now, he, many are called, but few are frozen. Chosen. So many are called. Because he calls everybody to the gospel, but he only chose to save those who would believe the message. So the message is to go out to everybody in the whole world. Now, look there in chapter 20. Chapter 20 where he says, the justice and compassion of the king. So he gets into it, look in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto, and blah, 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 blah. So we're not talking about the church, how the church is. But if you take all of this information and apply it to the church, that you can apply it if it fits, if it's truth and there's principles, but you can't take the primary point of it and apply it to it. Because I believe all scripture has a primary point. 
There can be little sub points to the things that you can apply to things to know. I believe we can do that. As long as you don't twist the scriptures and try to make them say and then swear to this is, this is it. There's so much of the word of God that I don't know yet. I'm trying my best to study these things and try to remember them. It's a, it's a riot. So anyway, he begins to show an awful lot of this justice and comparison that he goes through here. And look over there now in chapter 22. In chapter 22, the king rejects the leaders. There's a parable of the marriage feast. And then he says, those who don't have on the proper dress, well, that's, that's the, I believe, the robe of righteousness. I believe it's, you have to believe on Christ to be there. And so he says in verse 12, and he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, bind him hand and foot and take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing of teeth. Now, every other place that we read that, it's also a little, it's a little words in there that says something along the lines of um, in hellfire. Cast him into hellfire. I believe this is what he's talking about. Now, some people, well, I should say something, there's a lot of people that are taking verses like this and say, see there, this is at the wedding up here with the Lord, and uh, there's people that were disobedient to the Lord. You know, there's those who trust Christ as Savior, but because you were not faithful and you weren't serving the Lord, when you get up here to the judgment seat of Christ, God is going to beat you with stripes. You're going to be punished. It's not just a loss of rewards of what you could have had. And those who knew the Lord's will and didn't do it, God's going to have to really beat the tar out of you. So does that cause you to look forward to the coming of Christ? I can't wait to get to heaven and see the Lord. What's he going to do? He's going to beat the tar out of me? Now, how can he chasten a child of God who's now in a glorified body who has no sinful nature and God is going to whoop him. And God's going to cast him out and so you can't come into the kingdom when I come down for the kingdom you're going to be cast out of the kingdom. You'd be surprised how many people are teaching that. And it's a false teaching. It's not true. Once you trust Christ as your Savior you are his child and wherever he is I will be. Doesn't it say in Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, work up, comfort one another with these words? Or does it say, scare everybody with this? <laughs> it's comfort one another with these words. And that wherever he is, I will be with him, and he'll never leave me and never forsake me. So he can't come here and leave me somewhere else. I believe that once you trust Christ as your Savior, you're saved, you're his child. And God is not going to take and have us stand at the judgment seat of Christ and answer for all of our sins and then punish us because of the sins that were done after we trusted Christ as our Savior. No. That doesn't even fit with the salvation by grace alone. Because now it's telling you that he's going to beat you for sins that you've committed. I got some other things that I want to say along that line. That's why, because we've been covering a few things in Matthew, I want to take and dive into that just a, a little bit more. But I do believe it's important. You see there in chapter 23, the king curses the leaders. You read this, now that he has gotten this far, he's putting a curse upon these leaders, and it's whoa, 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 whoa unto these leaders. You hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. And that's why he says there, you, in verse 13, you are not going into the kingdom of heaven, and you don't want to keep, let anybody else get into the kingdom of heaven. So they rejected the king, they rejected the kingdom. They're not going in, and they're trying to turn the people against the king. Now, would that make you upset if you were Jesus? Jesus? And that's why in chapter 23, in verse 37, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks together. He says, and you would not. But you know what he told them? He said up there in verse 37, he said, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. 
And the reason for that is because he says in verse 39, Ye shall not see me henceforth from now on till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's when he comes back here. And Israel will see him and be saved as in a day, a whole nation born into God's family. And so it's believing that Jews will be the start of this kingdom and go into this thousand-year reign upon the earth. And you have there in chapter 24 the future coming of the kingdom. He talks about that and lets you know some of the problems that they're going to be. And so when you get to chapter 24, chapter 24 is talking about this right here. Chapter 25 is talking about this right here. When you saw she the king coming to the great Now, where have we got the church at? You can't take all those verses and put them to the church. Look in chapter 25. Excuse me, 24, chapter 24. First mistake I've made. When he makes the statement there in verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, one taken and one left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. So nobody usually asks the question, okay, well, where were they taken? Oh, well, that's the rapture. That's the rapture. No, it's not the rapture. This is not talking about the church. They haven't even come on the scene yet. When he's talking about one taken and one left, look very quickly there in the book of Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, page 1100, very quickly. So I'm waiting on you. Y'all are slow turners. Holding me up. Now look what he says there, and pretty much the same thing, verse 34. And I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. <laughs> we got that. Uh, the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Two men shall be in the field, one taken, one left. And they answered and said, Where, Lord? Finally, we got a good question. Where were they taken? And he answered then, in the rapture. Wheresoever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Well, that's, that's when Christ comes back. Power and great glory. The battle of Armageddon. That's where he says, and God calls for the fowls of the air to come together, and eat the flesh of mighty men and captains and all that, and horses and all. They eat the flesh. They're taken to the battle of Armageddon. They're not taken... These are the ones that are destroyed. Remember in the times of the flood, as it was in the days of Noah, the flood? Well, the judgment was not upon those in the ark. It was upon those that were not in the ark. Sodom and Gomorrah, it wasn't a judgment upon the ones that got out of the city. It was a judgment upon those that were still there. These were, and they were all destroyed. This is talking about those who go to that battle of Armageddon. These are the nations that come against the Lord. So... When you see it, and it begins to open up. Okay, I can see that. I can see that. And I can see that. And it helps you to see it just a little bit better. Now, chapter 26, you have the passion of the king. This is about the king. He's said everything, done everything. There's only one thing left for him to do. And that's to die. So he yielded himself, and he let the leaders do to him whatever they wanted to do. They have put it from him. They rejected him. He was crucified. So you have that in chapter 26. And then you have in chapter 27, continuation. Chapter 28, the king is alive. Chapter 28, the king is alive. Is he alive? He's alive. And that's why they were still asking about the kingdom. Will thou at this time set up the kingdom? Interesting. But we'll get into that another time. Look up here. This stuff is, I believe it's, it is so real. It is so true. But whenever you see certain things, you can read that and say, okay, this goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. I used to wonder, they used to somebody, you ever heard of a dance called disco? Disco. Somebody asked me one time and says, do you know how to disco? I says, well, I know Disco's here, disco's there, disco's here, disco's here. I guess I can do disco. Anyway. This goes here, this goes there. This goes here, this goes here. Why did I do that? 
You know, y'all can ruin a good preacher. Does hand represent you and me? The wall represents sin. We all have sin on us. God loves us. Hates our sin, but he loves us. And because we committed a sin, we have to pay for it. We're guilty. We did it. You say, what is sin? Well, whatever it is, you did it. And you're guilty. And the Bible says the penalty is eternal separation from God in hell. And to go to heaven, you have to be as righteous as God. None of us are righteous. None of us are perfect. We've all sinned. We've all come short of God's perfection. So the Bible says we need to pay for these sins. Well, what will he accept? A death payment. That's the only thing you and I can give is a death payment. There's no other payment he wants. Good works. That's not a death payment. So this hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the flesh. Came into the world because he loves us. Hates our sin because our sin separates us from the Lord. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. He came into the world, took our sins, paid for them on the cross. Came back from the dead. And said that if you and I, if we would believe that he did it for us. He says, you cannot see the kingdom of God, enter into the kingdom of God, unless you're born again. Because that's a spiritual realm where we're going to live with the Lord for all. It's another realm. So have I trusted Christ as my Savior? Yes, 55 years ago. You see, Christ came back from the dead. Said if I would believe that he did this for me. He'd put this payment to my account and I would have eternal life and go to heaven whenever I die. So can you know you're going to heaven? I'm going to heaven. That song John sang this morning. What was the name of it, John? I know where I'm going. going. He did a good job on that. Very good. So I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? You know, there's a lot of people that don't know where they're going. That's what makes what we say and what we do so important. That's what makes this ministry important. Let's pray, shall we? With head bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust Him right now? Just say something simple like this. Lord, I don't understand it all. I know I'm a sinner. And I believe Christ died and paid for my sin. I'm going to trust Him right now to take me to heaven whenever I die. And friend, God said if you trust Him, He'd save you. Give eternal life. Would you do that? If you're watching by the internet, right now, right where you are, would you trust Christ as your Savior? Right there on the screen says, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. If you will, would you do that? It just lets us know that somebody out there is listening and watching and trusted the Lord. And we'd like to know. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for all you do for us. We ask your blessing upon each person here and help us, Lord, to realize your coming is so close. Help us to be found faithful. We don't want to be like the days ago now. We have gone too far. We didn't serve you too long to mess up now. There's so much at stake. And I pray, Lord, your will to be done in the lives of each person here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.